not only did we have his likeness, but we were cut out of God. So the dominion that God has, he gave us a responsibility to exercise that dominion over the fowl of the air, over the fish of the sea, and over everything that creepeth upon the face of the earth. Also, the shadow. When we look at it in the Hebrew, the Hebrew writings, uh, they were written using pictographs or images. So their letters are not like our letters, but they were letters uh, or pictograms that, or shapes of images that really spoke to how they defined the word. So the first letter has the appearance of a fish hook, something that is cut out, like you stuck a, a hook in the, in, the, in the water to fish, and then you reel it out, it comes out. So the first image is that fish hook. The second image, Lamed, is the image of an ox head or a gold, and it has the connotation of learning, studying, or teaching. The last letter is the letter Mem, which is the word for water, or the letter for water. It also refers to time and waiting, time and waiting. So when we talk about an image, when the Hebrews, when the people of faith originally read the word about an image, they saw that it was referring to something that was taken out of something, that was a process for them to learn, to be taught, for them to study, and they understood that it took some time to do this. So when we say when we are made in the image of God, we understand that we are taken out of something. And then we have to spend time learning. We have to spend time studying, because if we're going to have the nature and the character of God, of course, <laughs> because of what Adam did, that stuff don't come to us naturally. <laughs> it's gonna take some time, praise God. So when we talk about an image, let's remember this as we go further in the study. So when we talk about, again, the image, we through that about it being cut out, I'm referring to uh, the idols and the statues that the nation would later become guilty of. But when we talk about the likeness, that means uh, to imitate or to emulate. It also is the same word where we get our imagination from. So when we talk about an image, uh, in order to have an image, you have to have a picture of something. Your imagination is a picture of something. Something that may not be in your physical presence or right there before you, but you have a picture in your mind that you are capturing. So uh, the likeness that we refer to here is also uh, a mental picture. And lastly, we're going to get into the shadow concept. Now, again, it said that God made man in his own likeness and in his image. In his image. In the image. And now we also understand that the word image also refers to the shadow. When we talk about a shadow, there are three concepts that we want to talk about. Number one, a shadow needs light. In order for there to be a shadow, there must be light. So you need a light, and then you need an object. When the light cannot pass through that object, it produces a shadow, right? You have the light shining. We most notably talk about the sun, right? When the sun is shining, and then there is, say, a tree, if the light cannot shine through the tree because it's not clear, it's not opaque, then you get the result, which is a shadow. The image that you see later is the shadow because the light cannot go through. When we talk about this with the Lord. God, <laughs> he is the light, right? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, same was with God in the beginning. Uh, I'm listening to that. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything that was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. God is the light, but we were made in his image. So not only is God the light, but he is the object. Mm, that's good. Mm. He is also the object. How can you pass through God? Sure. <laughs> no man coming to the Father but by me, right? So the light is shining on God. God is shining on himself. And we are now in the shadow. We are in the distance behind him, trying to reflect the image of God. 
Right? For a shadow, you need proximity. Now, shadows change size based on how close they are to the light. So, sometimes the shadow seems really small. Sometimes it seems bigger. It depends on the proximity to the light. The closer that the uh, shadow is to the light source, or sorry, the closer the object is to the light, the bigger the shadow will be. The further the object is from the light, the smaller the object or the shadow will be. The last point my brother mentioned before, he talked about uh, being in line. A shadow requires an alignment. Shadows require alignment. In order for this to be a shadow, the light and the object and the shadow are all in a straight line. If there is not a straight line, then there is no shadow. But as long as there is a line, God's going to be in place, we know. God again is in place, we know. The question is, Adam, where are you? So when we talk again about the shadow, the purpose of the shadow is to threefold. We're going to look at first the reflection from a shadow. The honor that comes with the shadow, and then the protection in the shadow. So, uh, as a shadow, a shadow again reflects, it emulates, it shows uh, exactly what the object is doing. I find it so interesting because a shadow has no brain, a shadow has no consciousness, a shadow cannot speak, a shadow cannot do anything except for what the object does. If the object is standing still, the shadow will be still. If the wind is moving a tree, then the shadow will appear to move. The only function of the shadow is to reflect what the image does. It does not go off on its own. It cannot go to the left when the shadow is standing still, or when the object is standing still. It cannot choose to move in its own uh, course of pathway. The only purpose of the shadow is to reflect the object. So then, if a shadow chooses to go its own direction, Adam, where are you? Because the object has chosen its path, and you're only supposed to reflect what that object shows. As a believer, our job is to reflect the Father, right? Do whatever he says we do. When his word tells us to do, that's what we do. When it tells us to pray, we pray. It says men ought to pray always. When it says that we ought to bless the Lord, it says I will bless the Lord at all times. Because we reflect what the word says, because the word is the Lord, our only job is to reflect God. Any deviation from the reflection is not a shadow. It poses the question, Adam, where are you? Because you're not reflecting the object or God whose pathway you should be standing in. You've chosen to go your own way. Number two, the honor. God declared man to be his living image. God declared man to be his living image. No other religion gives man such a high honor. In most cases, <laughs> people are seeking to get copies of an image of their God. They want little Buddhas, right? They want little statues that they can bring into their home, that they can pray to, that they can see, that they can worship. Not with God. God says, I'm making you in my image. So you are the image of God. You don't have to go and seek an idol. You don't have to go and seek anything to bring uh, God closer to you because you are in the image of God. You don't need uh, any rocks or forests or trees or anything, but we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, or we present our bodies as the shadow of God. Yes. We present our life as that. Number three, there is a protection that comes with being a shadow. Uh, shadows denote protection. Just like the shade that you get from a tree. As it, if, if it's raining tonight, and if you were outside and had no umbrella, if you could get under the branches of the tree, you're under the protection of that object. It has a, a branch that's covering you, and under its shadow, you can find refuge. The scripture put it this way Psalm 91. 
He who dwelleth in the what? Come on. Right? Shadow of the Almighty. So there is protection that comes to us when we are in the shadow. However, when we step out of that shadow, just as we were protected in the shadow, we are then left subject to trouble, to peril, to danger, because we have chosen to leave the place of protection. Adam, where are you? Let's go further. So Genesis 1 28. I'll make sure I'm doing my time. God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All right, so we already established the fact that man was made to the image, made to be a shadow, but now when we consider again the headship that God gave to man, we see that here in the blessing from Genesis 1 and 28. Let's look a little further at these words. When we talk about headship, and from the scripture we read the word subdue, and we read the word dominion, all right? To subdue means to conquer. It means to bring things under control. So when God created man in his own image, because God has all things under his control, he told man, while you're here on the earth, subdue this earth, take control of the earth. So when we talk about kinship, and I, I wanted to pause here to make a, a, a statement, I know we talk about the man being the head of home and house, and we're going to get to that a little bit, but when God, in the first commandment that he gave to man, he did not make us to be lords over people. He did not want you to be lords over individuals, but he made us to subdue the earth. He made us to have power over the earth. That's why Adam was so blessed by God that all things were under his control. He had the mind of God. He went around naming the animals because he had the mind of God. Who knew what to call a giraffe? Adam did because he was in the image of God. Who knew what to call an elephant? He did because he had the mind of God. Who knew the difference between uh, all, all the different species of birds? Adam did because he had the mind of God. He had all things under his control. He had no fear. He could go up to the line because all things were up under his control. He told them, have dominion over the fowl of the air, over the fish of the sea, and everything that creepeth over the earth. You have the rule, you have the control, you are the overseer, you have preeminence on the earth. So when God gave man headship in Genesis, it was over the earth and over all creatures on the earth. When we look at the word headship, it refers to being master, it refers to being lord, it refers to being chief, and it refers to being prominent. But the scripture also shares with us that there are things in place in the world, and actually this episode here in the book of Genesis is where we first get more of an in-depth look at this, because when we talk about rediscovering our headship, we have to acknowledge that, or that is a statement where we're acknowledging that man lost his headship. Man lost his headship. Man lost the ability to subdue. Don't believe me? Look at global warming. Praise God, it's real. Don't believe me? Go outside and go talk to a lion. Hey, get up in his face. Where's your headship today? Adam, where are you? So we messed up. First John chapter 2, verse 16 tells us, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the what? So these things are not in the image of God. They're not from God. They are of the world. Thereby, establish that if we are in the shadow, there is perfect alignment between the light, between the object, and between the shadow. If we step out of that straight line, we are not now uh, following the things of the Father, but we're following the things of the world. Man says shit. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Verse 6. We understand that after God created Adam, he caused a deep sleep to come upon him, and from his side will come a woman, and her name was Eve, the mother of all living things. 
We understand that also in the garden was a tree, right? It was, uh, well, there are many trees, but in the center of the garden, there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They, Adam was told explicitly that the day that you eat of this tree, ye shall die. The translation of that means dying, ye shall die. Dying, ye shall die. Dying, ye shall die. So here was the play on words. The serpent comes to the eat, the woman Eve and says, you shall not surely die. Because we understand what it meant was dying, ye shall die. Not an instant death of your life. He didn't lose, they didn't lose their life immediately. But a death entered the world. Dying, ye shall die. Killing you soft. Okay. So man's headship. He talks to me in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 and tells her you shall not surely die. And so she starts looking at that tree. The lust of the flesh. She saw that the tree was good. So I wanted to point that out because when I was reading the lust of the flesh started in Genesis chapter 3. Number two, the lust of the eye. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And she found out because the serpent told her, you don't want it. The Lord told you not to eat that fruit because he knew that the day that you eat of it, you will be just as wise as he is. She desired her to be made wise. The pride of life. So, he did take of the tree. She ate of the fruit. And she did not die. And then came Adam. And she talked to Adam. And she says to Adam, we will not surely die. I just ate from the tree. Here, take it. He listened to Eve. And in that moment, man's headship was forfeit. Because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. From that moment, the straight line alignment that we saw with God is the light, God is the object that we are reflected, and Adam being in the image or in the shadow of God, cut out of God, that straight line alignment was dis uh, interrupted, and Adam chose to step out of the alignment. And now we've got a situation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord God calls unto Adam and says, Adam, where art thou? What does Adam say? I heard your voice and I was afraid. Now, this is immediately how you know Adam has lost his headship because he's scared. You mean to tell me just yesterday you was talking to the uh, gorillas and apes and tigers and bears? Oh my. <laughs> and now, because God is in the asking, where are you? Now you're scared. Because remember, in the shadow, there's protection. But when you leave the shadow, when you leave being in the image of God, now you're unprotected. And so now he's afraid. The scripture tells us that Adam and Eve, immediately when they ate from the tree, their eyes were open, they realized they were naked, and they tried to cover themselves. So sin, when we step out of headship, when man stepped out of headship, sin immediately goes to work on your psyche and on your mind. You can't even sin comfortably. <laughs> you can't sin comfortably. There's no way you can sin comfortably. So what did they do? They had to go find some leaves. Let's get some leaves and cover. What are you covering? Because you've been exposed. So when you leave headship, you're now exposed. You're afraid, you're exposed, and now you're hiding. Trying to cover yourself with whatever is convenient. The first thing you can find is some fig tree leaves. And so you put that on, and now you identify what areas are, 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 are problematic and what have now covered what, what should not be seen. And so you're trying to cover yourself because you have now convinced yourself because you're so smart because you desire to be wise. And now you're saying, I'm afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. The Lord says to him, who told you you was naked? Who, who, who told you all this? Did you have feelings? Yeah. Oh, you're good. But to go back, so my top is God. Yeah. 
Something that caught him by surprise mm -hmm. because they did have that same in a point, right? Again, we talk about this alignment. There's a order, there's a system, right? And so God came every day in the cool of the day, walking in the garden to talk to Adam. And now, because Adam did not do him at all, he knew that that appointment was coming. He knew he had to give an answer as well. But because his friendship was gone, yeah. Again, he's now not covered. Mm. He's not covered. The word courageous. Don't ever be in a position where you're not covered. Yeah. Wow. Don't ever be in a position where you're not covered. Because then you're susceptible to all forms of danger. And it's frightening when you've been in a position where you've had dominion. And now that dominion has been taken away from you, you don't even know how much trouble you're actually in. Because, you know, when you have dominion, when you have control, the Lord is my life, I told you who I feel. You're not afraid of nobody. You walk with a brain like that. I mean, who's going to check out? You was the one running things. But now when you're exposed and you have no covering, because he knew that he was in a mind with God, he knew that God would have his back and everything that he made. But now when you're out of alignment and when you're not in the shadow of God, now you are exposed, you're susceptible to whatever danger might come your way. And what answer do you have but to say, I was afraid and I was like, now you have to throw yourself in the mercy of God. He thought he was doing that by covering himself, but he didn't even have the right tools to cover himself. So then you're inventing ways to cover yourself, trying to backtrack. And your ways that you're trying to do, they're not right. God says your ways are not my ways, neither are your thoughts my thoughts. That happened because of the consequence of Adam losing headship, right? Because how did we go from Adam having the mind of God, naming everything, but now he doesn't even know how to cover himself because he didn't have a need to be covered before. He was already covered. He was looking for a physical cover. Again, now, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, he's operating entirely on a different system. His mind is not configured to the ways of God, and now he's going based on his flesh and based on his own human nature. And God is asking, where are you? Why am I not ashamed of the gospel? You knew I was coming. That's our first thing you need to learn. You knew I was going to there. You know what's expected. And now you're gone. You haven't left the physical place. But to my brother's point earlier, I think your original point, talking about getting out of position. You're no longer in position. You have given up your nature. And this is something that has played man from that one choice all throughout the rest of time. Throughout scripture, we constantly see where man is in particular moments where they give up their nature. Even for what we later reclaim in terms of being the head, man still gives up his attention. It's the winners. And each time, you can find it under the category of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the prior life. And so now we're enveloped in a system where we can't get out and we're, and, and, and we're stuck. Numbers chapter 11, and we also see this parallel in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We see where Israel gives up this headship. Israel being the chosen nation of God, the nation that God chose, wasn't the biggest nation, but it was God's chosen nation. It was the nation, the people that God chose, but they gave up their headship. Here they are after being delivered from Egyptian captivity, they're in the wilderness, and they are basically in conflict with Moses because they hungry, and they tired of eating the same stuff. They don't want no more manna. I'm tired of this man versus four I want some meat. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they say. 
Yeah. I'm tired of this bread. I know it's a miracle that is here every day, but I want some meat. Let's go to flesh. All right. Who shall give us flesh to eat? That's what they ask in Moses. We in the wilderness. In the wilderness, God has opened up rivers, and we walking on dry. I mean, seas, and we walking on dry ground. And your question is, when can I get some meat? Blessed are the eyes. We so need to be idolaters and selling them works. Then we know that the nation went yeah, into idolatry. Because why? They wanted a God that they can see. So we want to be yeah. like the other nations. Yeah. They can see their God. They got a king. They can see their king. We want somebody that we can see. Did you not see the hand of the Lord when he delivered you? Did you not see God fight your battle? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, and even to, to, to your point, to what we experience in life today, it may not be, we may say, on the magnitude of what the Israelites experience. But you know there are things in your life that nobody could do for God. And then some of us still question, well, you know, I got time. I don't got to serve today. Like, I got about five more years in the world. You know, we try to schedule our salvation. Nobody ever tells me, okay. Some of us try to schedule our salvation because we knew we had some cut up time in the world. And then when I get about, about 30, 27-ish, 30-ish, for 27, I'll start coming. And then by 30, I'll really be in a group that I can be saved and free. We thought that we had time. Now, pride of life. Neither let us tempt Christ, neither murder. So Israel gave up this nation as well. And the consequence, God had given them a land, right? Home of milk and honey. They had vineyards they did not plant. They had homes they did not build. But because of their disobedience, they found themselves in captivity, kicked out of their land, exiled. Everything that they had lost had been turned down. Because they, even as a nation, they gave up their spot of prominence. Fornication. Lord help us, right? So man is struggling. With his head, thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah for Jesus, because we didn't know what we was going to do. So St. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 10, we see the temptation of Jesus. After Jesus was baptized, the Bible tells us that he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, and here he was tempted of the enemy. The enemy comes to him, look at this, not the flesh. He tries the same tactics that he tried in the Garden of Eden, the same tactics that the nation of Israel failed to, he tries them on Jesus. He comes to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of Man, I command that these stones be made bread. Jesus is fast to prove, and he's going to talk about make some bread. Okay, he tried to get Jesus to eat, he tried to get Jesus to surrender his head. What did Jesus say to him? Come on. Right? Now we're talking about rediscovering our headship. No man on earth was able to help us rediscover our head. But thank God that Jesus came to show us how to do it, right? So when the enemy came and tried to attack the flesh, Jesus gives him the solution. Tell him what the word says. That man said, uh, it is uh, not by the bread alone can you live, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Right? Then he tells them, he took them up into a high mountain, and he tells them, look at all the kingdoms of the world that are here. All these kingdoms I'm going to give to you. I'm going to make you the head. <laughs> the enemy is telling Jesus, I'm going to make you the head. I'm going to give you these kingdoms. Kingdoms that Jesus already possessed. All right. He can tell him, I'm going to make you to have all these kingdoms. Lust of the eye. He tries to get the Lord to perform the head right now. But again, Jesus tells him, it is written. Right? The third time, he comes to him and tells him, well, I'll give you everything, all these kingdoms of the world for a moment in time, I'll give to you if you will bow down yourself and worship me. Again, Jesus has to tell him, it is written. 
The only way that we have to reclaim our headship is through what is written in the word of God. It is not going to come through a self-help course. It's not going to come through uh, no support group. It's not going to come through any other means but by the word of God. I'm not just spreading in a support group or trying to touch you with the world, the systems of the world, the things that the world has to offer. And we understand that there, there is a victory world. that overcomes and the world. And in first John chapter five, verse four, it tells us that victory comes through our faith. Through our faith is the way that we're able to do it. And lastly, when the devil comes to try to tackle again, we're told in James chapter four that we should resist the devil and that he will flee from it. So again, every time that we have seen these attacks that have come trying to threaten the, the headship that man was designed to possess, which again was never to lord over people, but he made us to have dominion over the earth, to subdue the earth, to uh, have dominion over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and over everything that creeps under the, the sea. But when we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 3. And this is where we see in the New Testament where it talks about the order of vision. He says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is who? All right. So when we talk about rediscovering headship, it starts right there. Not your headship. <laughs> Understanding who was the head of you. And the head of every man is. Uh, Christ. Again, we have our example of being in the shadow of God, with him being the light, him being the object, and us being his shadow or his reflection. If we are not trying to reflect the object or the image of God, then we have no basis to claim headship at all. Because if Christ is not the head of man, or is not your head, then you have no basis to claim headship over anything else. It begins with understanding that Christ is the head. Christ is the head. I think I have a slide this I'm just going to carry it out. And when we look at this word in the Greek, this word translated as head in that scripture, it often a typo, refers to not just being the head, but also being a cornerstone. You don't have to have a, a cornerstone. So when we talk, see that word in the scripture in the New Testament not, and God. saying that Only Christ God. is the head, man is the head, it's that. not always you again just right. talking one about one, one as a ruler, right. but as a cornerstone yeah, which connects objects and a foundation and a building. The cornerstone is what's needed to connect the walls and to maintain order and symmetry throughout the building. If a cornerstone is at a wrong angle, then every wall for that building will be slanted and eventually it will fall down with time. But when a cornerstone has been laid in a straight foundation, then that building has a sound structure to stand upon. So if Christ is the head of your life, if he is the cornerstone, then you have a solid foundation to stand upon. But if he's not the head of your life, then your structure is going to certainly fall. Same way as a man trying to be the head of a woman. First of all, Christ must be the head of that man. But if the man does not have that structure for the woman, then the walls of that structure will fall down. You have no, you have no basis to try to be the head of any woman if Christ is not the head of you. You have no, no basis for that because that is the, that's the order that God has established. And we understand that the head of Christ is God. So the key to rediscovering the headship that God has for man lies in, number one, understanding that Christ is the head of man. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. On other ground, sink and sink. But Christ has to be the head of man. Number two, we mentioned at length, talking about the alignment and the order that must be in place. That God is the light. God is also the object that we are reflecting. And then the shadow must be all in a straight line. If there's not a straight line between the light source, the object, and uh, the shadow, then you cannot have a shadow. 
Also, remember the concept of proximity, that the closer the object is to the light, the bigger the shadow will be, and vice versa. So you have to maintain proximity to the object in order for your shadow to be reflected on the earth. Remembering the fact that God said in the word, it tells us to let our light shine before men that they might see our good works and bring glory to God. So it is our objective, it should be our objective, to have a big shadow, right? The bigger our shadow, the more glory that can come to God. But if we are despising the proximity concept and trying to distance ourselves, then we diminish our shadow and we diminish the impact that we can have. Then how can you try to be the head of anybody if you're trying to diminish the head of your world? It doesn't work. So these are some of the concepts, again, that we want to set, establish. And I'm going to pause in a moment because we're getting close to our time. And I want to open up if there's any further discussion or any questions that we can look at. But those are the main concepts that I wanted us to explore today when we had the question, Adam, where are thou? It's a question, again, that was posed to Adam because of his choice, not because of a consequence of what he did, but because of a consequence of what Adam chose to do after he did her act. We're not going, we're not going to blame you tonight. I'm sorry. We're not going to do that. Because Adam could have threw that fruit out and moved on. But thank God for Jesus. He had a plan in his life. But we're not going to blame her. We're talking about Adam. That was the question. Not Eve, where are you? Adam, where are you? Why have you distanced yourself? What have you allowed to come in between us? So Whatever you allow to, to, to cloud your mind, whose voice are you listening to? What conversations have you had? That's what he was asking God in that moment. And now we have the opportunity to rediscover what it truly means to have that show. But I'll call and see if there are any questions or any comment points that anybody wanted to share in our final moments. But I too was blown away when I was studying this a couple months ago and, and discovered that image and shadow were so closely related. It made me look at it again another way because who has ever had to ask their shadow, where are you? I'm, raise your hand. Did I, did I miss a hand? I'm sorry. But who has ever had to ask their shadow, where'd you go? <laughs> no one told me that I knew that wherever you go, that's where your shadow goes. And so that's pretty much what the Lord was posing to ask. You're my shadow. What happened? I don't see you no more. Because you're hiding. Because you're scared. You're afraid. Anyone else? A question or a comment before we um, we're going to close out in prayer? No? All right. Well, I, I want to pray before we before we close out today. And again, thank you all for um, walking with me through what I study. And hopefully, it, it made some sense to you, and you were able to glean something from it. But I do want to pray for us collectively, as men, young men, that um, as we're in this world, like we said, now because of a consequence of of Adam's sin and the fall of man, there's just so much presented to man that um, you can easily lose that alive, right? And even try to do the right thing, you can find yourself going the wrong way. So I want to pray with us that we would um, find ourselves in the right position, that we would understand what God meant when he gave us dominion, and that we would be able to walk with the authority that God give, has given us 
now as new believers, I didn't even mention this, but you know, after we're filled with the Spirit, we have this new authority that God has given us. And this new headship. He says, Behold, I give you power, right? And ye shall become witnesses. That's headship that has been given to me. He tells us also, Behold, I give you power to walk upon the serpents and scorpions and over, how, over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you or harm you. He tells you, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's the headship that God has for men on our spiritual side. But again, that alignment. It's so critical. So I just want to pray now, and then we'll turn it back over. Uh, if you will stand with me, we're both going to pray. So, what? That came Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you today for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We give the name of praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, so grateful for your blessings, for your love, and all that you have given us. We thank you today for this gathering of young men, O God, who have been called here today to give your word, Lord, and have a desire, Lord, to walk in enlightenment and purpose of your will for our lives, O God. Father, we thank you for every brother, for every family that you represent, every future that they present, every ministry, and every every Yet, oh God, that you have equipped us with, oh God. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us for our sins and for our wrongs, oh God. We see those choices that we made in our past, maybe even presently, Lord, that we have chosen to forfeit the patience that you have given us, oh God. We chose deliberately to go a different pathway, oh God. We're asking for mercy, Lord. We're asking God that you will let us know that you will let us know that you will let us know that you will let us our attention, our decisions, oh God. Purify, oh God, our motives, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God. We have to show us our thoughts and our thoughts, Lord. Those things in us that are not pleasing to you and those things that are contrary to your word. Our cares that are out of us right now, oh God. All my belief, oh God. All insecurity, oh God. All fear, oh God. And doubt, oh God. Confusion and questions in our mind. Questioning, oh God. Oh God, the path that you the holy that you have for our life, God. We cast it out of our minds today, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Be quite right now in the name of Jesus. And when you come looking to us, oh God, that we will position ourselves to be bad by the Lord, oh God. That we won't go for our counterfeit covering, oh God. That we won't try to cover ourselves with weeds, oh God. That you have come in the name of God. We are God, oh God. And Father, we stand on the promises of your word, Lord. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would touch our minds, oh God. To be mixed by your word, O oh God. Be for you, O oh God. Every thought of the enemy, Lord, the desires, O oh God, to bring us into a path of destruction and degradation, O oh God. To walk contrary to your word, Lord. To be disobedient to those things that you have called us to do, O oh God. We want to be a man of God, O oh God. As the word says, O oh God, show yourself a man, Lord. Help us to be the man of God that you have called us to be, O oh God. That we might walk into being and authority, O oh God. Not lording over our others, oh God, but yeah. walking in the divine is no more than what you called us to do, oh God. But we can lay hands on the sick, hallelujah, and can we can be a witness, oh God, to so that are lost, Lord, that you will be converted by our testimonies, oh God, that we will cry out, what must I do to be saved, oh God? Not us to walk in the authority of your word, hallelujah, that we can call things that are not as so they were, oh God. Jesus, hallelujah, Father, oh God, let your spirit rest upon us, like you will be a real, oh God, even as we go to serve this one tonight, Lord, we ask that your power and your glory, Lord, would be your sanctuary, oh God, I will never swear, oh God, and your own signs and wonders will be performed by your God, I will power of your spirit, hallelujah, and your soul will be delivered, Lord, let soul be saved, and let life be transformed, oh God, Lord, Yeah, no. We'll make your name go. 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 We'll make your